bread. Well, now that you've clapped, I don't want to disagree with them. Um, <laughs> I think uh, Nick, ha Nick has answered for all of them. In no, I, I actually do disagree with him. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I don't. I disagree with much of what he. I, I agree with much of what he said, but I do think the world does not see things in black and white. Uh, in such black and white terms, you go into a grocery store. There's a top shelf. There's a middle shelf. There's a bottom shelf. We all do this. We all want to know about varying quality of the things that we buy, and equally, there's a demand to know about the varying levels of sustainability. I totally agree with Nick about not calling something sustainable that doesn't meet the standard. But I think there are other tiers that can help move people along towards that standard and towards sustainability and give them rewards for doing it. And also benchmark where they really are uh, in terms of their status, uh, which is useful to consumers and major buyers who care about that. Thanks, uh, Brad. We have a couple of questions, uh, written questions from the audience. Uh, I will quickly take them up. One is, uh, do you, uh, this is for marine, marine, uh, Standards, do you certify any of the shark fin industry? This is from Wilmar, Kelly from Wilmar. Jeez, I thought I was going to avoid that kind of a question in this crowd. Are there any standards? <laughs> uh, the Marine Stewardship Council does not certify uh, shark finning operations. Oh, that is good news. Defined as cutting the fins off of a shark and discarding the body. That's, that's not allowed in our system. Period. And another question is on small holders. Does one of the scheme holders have experience with stepwise approaches to include storm small holders? I think they, a book can be written on the stepwise approaches, but if briefly, maybe Alistair. Yeah, we do. We have um, a modular approach program, which has a, a similar challenges that have just been discussed. You know, we need to maintain the credibility of our brand but we also want to improve forest management where we can. So uh, we have this modular approach program, and we have to keep that balance between the credibility and the improving forest management. With smallholders, we have additional programs. We have a, uh, a standard called Small Low Impact Managed Forests, SLIMP, <laughs> it's called. It's nice. And um, that's used very widely now, particularly in group schemes for smallholders. And it, it attempts to keep the integrity of the standard, but make it uh, more applicable to smallholders. So some of the, the indicators are different. Some of the things you have to do in order to get certification are different, easier. Um, and that's been very successful in working with big group schemes with smallholders. There's a different kind of certification. It's the same language but the, and the same criteria, but there's different ways of actually auditing. The approach is different. It's a different approach. Okay. And, and we also now have a, a label, which is for small and community producers. So to try and get a differentiation in the marketplace uh, that gives weight to small community producers. Giving them market access through this SCP Additional market label. access. And further now, we also have a smallholders, we've been busy, um, we have a, a smallholders fund. So we're looking to actually generate funds from the wider system that we can then pump back in to help smallholders get certified and get the benefits from certification. And it's growing and it's becoming, it's a kind of a, a new thing for us and we're going to see how it goes. but using benefits from the system to then encourage smallholders. The fund is expanding, you're getting a good response on the fund, the smallholders fund. It's initially, it's, it's very interesting how it's going, so. All right, thanks. That person uh, in the end, yeah, the number two, yes. Um, I have a question for all the panel, which is the certification industry is codependent um, on certifiers. Um, and how do you, as schemes, approach uh, investment and capacity building? Investment and capacity building, how you approach uh, the certification, the codependent issue and the investment and capacity building. Daryl, you would like to take it first? Um, the echo is really bad in my side. I, I didn't get the question, so sorry. Can you repeat that, please? For standards, you have a codependency on the certification industry. And I'd like to understand how each of the schemes is approaching building capacity in the certification industry. Because we have multiple competencies required um, in terms of growing, biodiversity, 
chain of custody, social skills, and there is a pinch point um, in the development of any standard that the aspiration and the ability is in two different places, and all schemes have to go through that, and it would be good to hear how the older schemes are approaching that, and how the newcomers um, are joining a, a long list of to-dos. Okay, so for RSPO, we, we are also finding this a concern, and we are addressing it in um, some of these ways. The first is, we need to identify, we need to get others to help us do this, people whose core business is training, for example. What we need to, so we need to identify competent trainers so that they can train the CBs, for example, certification bodies. Uh, but we also then, before that, need to identify what are the components of these trainings ourselves. So we are in the midst of doing that in the Secretariat. And the second phase is to identify those whose core business is training so that they can extend this training uh, globally. And we may, we may uh, get the you know, accredited trainers in each region in the world. Uh, secondly, I think uh, we also are looking at uh, organizations, for example, like the High Conservation Value Resource Network. They are now going towards uh, becoming a uh, accreditation body, something like that, for the high conservation value assessors. That's something we really look forward to because that is a constraint at the moment uh, in, in producers getting certified and, uh, and you know, around the world many people don't know what high conservation value is. Right, uh, thanks Daryl. Uh, Nick, you would like to take it up next? Uh, yeah, just, uh, just a couple of points. Firstly, thank you for the word codependency. I'll treasure that one. Um, secondly, for Bon Sucro, we have an active program of seeking to develop local uh, certification capabilities within countries in which we're focusing. And thirdly, don't for a second think that we aren't collectively talking about this all the time. We, uh, we now meet this group and others because we realize we have much the same issues. The, uh, our mutual plans and the same issues arise for all of us. We're constantly talking now about the relationship we have with certification bodies. We understand the dynamics and we've seen the various models of how it works. We are where we are though. Um, certification can't move forward without the active participation of certification bodies. Um, we are all with our respective boards and between us talking about this all the time. This, this won't go away or be, or be transformed overnight, but don't be surprised if the engagement doesn't continue to be robust and we welcome observations such as yours. I, I, I love the idea of codependency. I feel slightly unclean as a consequence of that now. So thanks for that one. Thanks, Nick, on local certification capability. Uh, we, we, we are running out of time, but we can still take two or three questions. Uh, that gentleman in, in the end, uh, yes. Uh, Dan Epstead at the Amazon Environmental Research Institute, EPOM. It's come up a, a few times over the last two days that um, the strength of the roundtables and the certification systems has been their lack of, a, of dependence on government, but that we're getting to a point where we're going to have to have engagement with government. The question is, what is the prospect for moving to a jurisdiction-wide level of certification? Uh, at the risk of sounding like uh, a half-pregnant uh, proposal, getting to Nick's point, um, it, it does seem like with consumer goods forum type demands on the horizon, uh, we need to move to scale more, more rapidly. Uh, we're going to need the help of policies, government institutions, rural extension systems, in a way that we have not been able to do that yet. And some of the systemic changes that will allow smallholders to participate more effectively and to make the transition and to face the costs um, will probably depend upon government engagement. So the question is, is there a scope for a, a, another type of certification that might be just focused on a downward trend in deforestation, better, better labor practices, what have you, um, so we can go to scale? Uh, 
Alistair, you would like to take it up? Yeah. Further certification, strengthening of certification. And yeah. Um, you know, we, were, we were set up in, at the start back in 93, 92, as a result of a perceived failure of governments to be able to deal with the problems of deforestation. So in a way, stakeholders gave up. But now we're seeing that governments are far more engaged. And uh, Ben talked about this yesterday with regards to uh, legislation about illegal logging. Um, it's coming from the European Union, North America, Australia. And there's lots of work that we're now doing with governments on aligning systems to make sure that we can work together. On your, on your question about whether there is scope to have kind of go to the next level and, and do certification of legislation, that's something that's been discussed a lot um, at kind of ICL level. ICL is a, a body that uh, FSC is a member of and other, other schemes are members of. Um, and talking about how you can, uh, where certification can go in the future, how it's going to relate to legislation. And, and I think the jury's still out about how, that's, how that could work. Um, at the moment, our success has been based on the market and having a, a market value for the label and for the certification. It's, it's been a voluntary system and been market driven. Once you start putting legislation in there, it changes that dynamic, which can make things quite different for the market. So um, we'd have to look at how our drivers would change based on that. Doesn't really answer your question, but uh, you know, it's a discussion. Thanks, Alistair. Any comment from Brad? Just, just one quick word. We actually have a couple of instances where governments have adopted the MSC standard and committed to meeting it uh, en masse. So the Danish government is committed to getting all of its fisheries certified to the MSC standard by, I can't remember the year, and we're just in a pilot with the government of Western Australia uh, on something similar. So that's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a twist on what you were asking, but a, an interesting one from my perspective. Yeah. Thanks, Brad. So we are almost out of time, but we will take two questions. These people have been waiting for a long, long time. Uh, number four, yes, please. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I would like to address my question to related with the coastal aquaculture development. Uh, under the AAC, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, at least there are seven principles described there that we need to maintain the presence of mangrove or rehabilitate if it is already degraded, which is following the national regulations. But what happened currently, there are quite a number of oil palm business also encroaching the coastal environment. So I don't know how to align between the ASG standard and also with the PNC in the RSPO. Thank you. <laughs> 